So now that the NFL season is finally wrapped up, I find myself with quite a bit more free time at my disposal, especially on Sundays and in particular Sunday nights. So, what am I supposed to do? Well, I guess I'll give Elimination Chamber a chance, he says. Well, so many people that talk about SmackDown is a superior brand, he says. Surely the company can't screw up the golden goose of a WrestleMania main event that would be a WWE championship match between Randy Orton and John Cena, he says. So lo and behold, what did I do? I sat my ass on my couch Sunday night in front of the Schlegtron 6000 and watched the WWE Network at what seemed like 360 pixels. I realized the whole subscriber price is only $9.99 a month. But if you're going to have this streaming service, after all this time, we're three years in now, can we figure out how to fucking get it to consistently stream at the supposed high definition levels that it's supposed to? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It literally looked like, for me, at least the first half of Elimination Chamber got better as the night went along. Like it was being streamed through my old webcam. But even that webcam had 480 pixels on it. Jesus Christmas. Unbelievable. But, you know, if you're trying to sit there and make the argument to me that SmackDown is a superior brand, why do you waste your time watching Raw? Why do you waste your time reviewing Raw? You know, when you should be watching and reviewing SmackDown. This was not the show to make an effective argument in my mind. This show felt like one gigantic waste of time. And if anything, I was hoping going into this, because I kind of half watch SmackDown, half don't. Just because I don't review it doesn't mean I don't pay attention to it or don't watch it at all. I just might not watch all two hours every single week. Um, but I thought, if anything, because I don't pay as close attention as I don't get so caught up in all the BS and all the maneuvering and stories and bullshit and everything else that maybe it would allow me to enjoy this show more. And the enjoyment was very few and far between. Lots of questionable decisions, and if this is the last stop for the SmackDown brand on the road to WrestleMania, it most certainly doesn't leave me feeling any better about the state of the WrestleMania 33 car. And any thoughts that I potentially had about going to SmackDown the Tuesday before WrestleMania, which is going to be right here in Richmond downtown, I have now, for all intents and purposes, changed my mind. I don't see myself wanting to go even if I got the tickets for free. That's just that simple. Um, but let's look at this show. I think one thing that really sums us up is just lots of questionable to bad decisions in terms of uh, the finishes, how they played out, who went over, who didn't go over. It just, and, and a lot of it just really results, again, to things being one gigantic waste of time. Like, you have Mickey James, Becky Lynch starts off the card. We did, that felt like it was an appropriate way to start off the show. But I'm sitting there and watching, and I see Mickey James. And even though she looks a little older in the face, and even though she's added a little bit of weight in her belly pooch, and frankly, who hasn't, I sit there and I say, that feels like a diva. That feels like a woman's star. That feels like a professional wrestling star. That's what a female professional wrestler should be. And then I see Becky Lynch. With her freaking streetwalker top, her white trash shorts, her freaking back page Craigslist hooker boots, with her bright glow hair, and I, I'm sitting there begging somebody in that company, please teach this bitch how to dress. It is really hard to take her seriously when she looks that shitty. And she does. She could look so much better. She could look cute. I'm not ever going to look at her the same way I would Mick, Mickey James necessarily. But I look at somebody like Becky Lynch, and there's a possibility and potential for so much more. She doesn't have to look like drizzling shit. But for some reason, she chooses to look like drizzling shit, and it's terrible, and it's hard to take her seriously because she looks like a fucking moron. Or in this case, in large part, a fucking whore. But as far as this match goes, you know... It's bad enough the commentary team, and that's just bad enough, period. At this point in time, give me a hybrid of the Russian and German teams, and even if I don't understand what the fuck they're saying, at least I'll care what they're saying. You know, they're sitting there talking about a commentary 
about how Mickey James has ring rust because she hasn't been in a WWE ring in seven years. Yes, because she hasn't wrestled anywhere else in the fucking world. You know, I get if you don't want to mention TNA directly by name, but at least you could reference to the fact that she's been other places and now she wants to come back. Because by sitting there and saying that she hasn't really wrestled in seven years and she has ring rust, it's just really a slap in the face to the fans. It's, again, insulting the fans' intelligence. And no matter how much the fans seem to like to have their intelligence insulted at some point in time, it comes to the detriment of your product, which we've gotten to that point in time in WWE. And furthermore, you bring back Mickey James. I know she has the bigger name, and she doesn't have to worry about losing one match or really taking away her appeal. But you do want to kind of reestablish her a little bit. So why not have her win by hook or by crook the first time against Becky Lynch and have a reason for the story to continue? Potentially get a bigger payoff for Becky Lynch down the road. No, instead, we just have to have the baby face go over and skip skip whoop de woo next. Speaking of the fucked up dynamics of how WWE thinks, the suspect sick sissy's in a two-on-one handicap match where he's the one that's at the disadvantage. He's supposed to be the villain. He's supposed to be the heel. And on the one hand, you can sit there and say, well, he said he wants to take them both out, but then he's taking out Kalisto before the match just to sit there and wrestle Apollo Crews so that way eventually Kalisto can come back in so that way the suspect sissy can lose and then attack these two after the fucking match. If you're going to do it this way and actually try to get heat on this guy even though he can't get heat because he fucking sucks, why not have him take out Kalisto like he did and then take out Apollo Crews and have no fucking match at all? The whole dynamics of this are stupid though. He sits there. He's the one technically that has the two-on-one disadvantage, so he takes out one of the guys to even up the odds. If anything, that would make him a babyface. Unbelievable. And please give Apollo Crews some type of gimmick. He looks like a mini Battletoad version of Bobby Lashley with a painted-on Evan Board smile. He looks ridiculous. Let's find him something better to do. And speaking of something better to do, that's what I was thinking of and looking for the entire time I watched this tag team turmoil title match. There's got to be something better to do. What a ginormous waste of my fucking time this match was. It was not good. It was crap. And all of this just to have American Alpha win. And, you know, it's one of these things where I look at a guy like Jason Jordan and I, I see the potential for money down the road. And a lot of you probably look at Chad Gable and say, well, here's a future star. And it just represents the fucked up place that this business is in general. But again, you've got freaking the Ascension are sitting there trying to be Road Warrior ripoffs and the worst possible version imaginable. Several other tag teams involved. This is just a waste. Just because you have tag teams doesn't mean you have a tag team division or a good tag team division at the very least. They could and they should, but of course they don't. So if you're going to use tag teams as a way to lure me into watching SmackDown, <clears throat> fail on your mission. Nikki Bella and Natalia. Now... Here is at least a match that has purpose and reason and meaning for happening. Fine, whatever. You can incorporate the Total Diva stuff. You know, Natalia took out Nikki Bella. Da, 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 da. But then as they're showing the video package, and even as they're talking about how Natalia was the one that attacked Nikki Bella and showing that revelation of how that came to be uh, kind of put out there, you're sitting there and you're listening to Natalia speaking, and again, it's one of these things where Nikki's supposed to be the one you're supposed to like and supposed to cheer for and get behind, but Natalia makes so much fucking sense. How could you not gravitate towards her? And of course, with these Breakfast Club-like type of politics, knowing Nikki Bella for all intents and purposes is on her way out. Knowing that she's not going to be there much longer. Instead of giving Natalia the rub here, letting Natalia go over... And helping Natalia in that SmackDown Women's Division as a whole for the rest of 2017, we go with this wishy-washy bullshit finish where nobody gets over, nobody gets anything fucking happening or just gets anything decisive. And it feels like one of these crappy, disappointing, territory-style finishes from the 80s where you have three months of programming just to sit there and have a double count-out or a double disqualification. And you're like, well, this is a gigantic waste of my fucking time. And this match between Nikki Bella and Natalia, once again, as so many things were on this card, was a gigantic waste of time. Randy Orton versus Luke Harper, it was a waste of time only in the sense that you, you knew what was going to happen here. And furthermore, this is just all placeholder for the Viper. That's all it is. Unfortunately, it ties in more to the Wyatt family crap. And oh, God. How the WWE finds a way to screw things up. But we'll touch on that in a moment. Randy Orton and Luke Carper was just okay. 
feels like a match that belongs on SmackDown, not a SmackDown pay-per-view. Uh, then we get to the women's title match, Alexa Bliss and Naomi. And you know what? Lo and behold, what do you know? Fucking Naomi finally gets a women's championship in that company. I was okay with that. I'm not going to shit on that. I, I find it interesting where people sit there and say that Naomi didn't deserve it, that she was lame, and there's so many other better characters. All right, in that women's division on either show, then seriously, let's be real here. Fucking name them! Exactly. Sit down and shut the fuck up. Furthermore, I think Naomi has improved quite a bit the past couple of years. You know, the way it's been with the women's belt in the past is pretty much everybody gets a run at that thing. It's like Kelly Kelly, everybody gets a turn. So I have no problem with Naomi getting it here, knowing that she's destined for the pre-show at WrestleMania anyways, where she's going to drop that strap in her home fucking town. And I'm sorry, I don't see what's so great about fucking Alexa Bliss. But these are the same type of wrestling fans that are trying to pump up to me how awesome Charlotte and Bailey fucking are. So what the fuck do I know at this point? What the fuck do I know? I'll just enjoy the fact that Naomi got her moment. The fans chanted, you deserved it. And, and it, it was a cool moment. That would surely be short-lived. But then we get to the main event, the Elimination Chamber match. <sighs> the one thing I've got to point out here, and I pointed it out on Twitter, and I'll point it out here again, is the level of depth of the genius of the politics of the Breakfast Club, and in particular John Felix Anthony Sr. You get your title at the Royal Rumble, so you get that big moment at the Big Four pay-per-view. You tie Ric Flair. You're one away. So any point in time that you really choose and, and or the company chooses, you can break that record and now everybody can stamp you as the greatest of all time and the internet will cry some more. But the genius of the man to win the belt at the Big Four pay-per-view, but to lose the belt at a filler pay-per-view a couple of weeks later, whereas he's wrestling in a match with five other people Apparently now, because John Cena was in this match, they decided they wanted to pad the freaking grade on the Elimination Chamber. I mean, Jesus Christ. It was the Elimination Gym map. That's ridiculous. Takes away a major part of the appeal of the match, where you sit there and say, It's so vicious, it's so brutal! Watch as we throw them from the ring onto the black mats outside! But the genius of John Cena saying, Hey, if I'm not going to keep this title, if I'm going to hand over this title, and I'm going to do some fucking stupid mixed tag match potentially at WrestleMania, then let me lose it, and let me lose it early on. And most importantly of all, let me make sure that I'm not the last guy to get pinned or submitted. Because that way, when the highlights are shown of who won the belt at this show, nobody's going to associate me with that moment because they won't freaking see me. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, that is brilliance. That is genius. That is professional politicking of the highest order. You can go back and you'll watch Royal Rumble and you'll remember the moment when John Cena won the title. But so many people go back to Elimination Chamber, they'll focus on who won, and then they'll see who he pinned in order to win his belt for the first time, and you won't see John Cena there. I mean, that's Hogan level shit right there. Unbelievable. It is also unbelievable that this company still, after all of this time, for all the times they've had John Cena and Randy Orton face off, now that the pieces were potentially in motion to have these two wrestle one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania, which does still need to happen someday, they decide to go away from that. And unfortunately, I consensus was coming. I begged for it not to come, and I was hoping for it not to come. But I knew this was where they were going. Everybody knew this was where they're fucking going. So again, you basically get an Elimination Chamber match that is 100% fucking predictable. If you already know in large part how the finish is going to happen, or at least who's going to stand tall at the end of the night, then why the hell would you watch the show? And this is a major significant problem for this company in recent years, and it continues to be so, and it only gets worse by the show. But Bray Wyatt, oh boy! Let me get this straight. This fuckstick, who can't win a major feud to save his freaking life, this dude who's never won at WrestleMania, that I can't remember when, if ever, he actually won a match at a Big Four pay-per-view, 
All of a sudden, Bob's your uncle out of the fucking blue. You're supposed to be excited that this dude is a fucking WWE champion? You actually think Bray Wyatt is worthy of carrying a world title strap into WrestleMania at this stage of his career? Give me a fucking break. Has the hate for John Cena gravitated to that level where you sit there and something like this happens and you're marking out for a dude whose character, frankly, doesn't fucking deserve it? Bray Wyatt feels like a June, July, September, October filler champion. He most certainly does not feel like a guy you put on the poster to hype up one of the featured marquee matches of WrestleMania 33. And even if, let's back up for a second, and I opine this on Twitter, if this was the path that you wanted to go down, they could have done so much more with it, which perfectly epitomizes to me Bray Wyatt's run of the past four years or so in WWE. Instead of going the way they went, they could have made some small tweaks and had it make a huge fucking difference. If this was the way you were going to go, then you should have had either A, at the Royal Rumble, Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt be the final two, and... Bray Wyatt tell Randy Orton to eliminate himself, and ultimately Randy Orton does. So that way you fully solidify Bray Wyatt's ability to play mind games, and you sell him once and for all as kind of like this cult-type figure that can move mountains and make magic happen. Imagine him getting one to the breakfast club to give up a main event spot at WrestleMania by just walking out of the freaking ring over the top rope at the Royal Rumble. Then you could come back here to the Elimination Chamber... This is where you can have it even be set up where you originally have six and then somebody gets taken out because of injury or whatever. And then at the last minute, they plug Randy Orton in and Randy Orton wins the title. And you've got Wyatt versus Orton at WrestleMania and the dynamics seem to work better. Or you still have Randy Orton win the Rumble. Then you get here to Elimination Chamber. You know, you can sit there and say, um, Bray Wyatt takes his spot. I mean, there's so many different things you could freaking do, is the point I'm getting at. You could sit there and have Randy Orton win the Rumble. This is my favorite one that I thought of. You could have Randy Orton win the Rumble and then immediately go DiBiase Andre with that shit and have him give the birth to Bray Wyatt. This is what I was trying to get at a moment ago where I fucking lost my train of thought and I tried to hide it but didn't do a very good job of it. Then you get to Elimination Chamber. Now you sit there, this is where you've got the six people. Then somebody gets taken out. You'll find out later, ultimately, that Randy Orton took him out because it was all one big master plan all along. Where Bray Wyatt's mind fucked Orton to the point where he's giving him the giving him the spot at WrestleMania in the title match, but all along it was really an insidious plan by the Viper himself. Never trust a snake, right? To where he could sit there and get the title, and then he'll deny Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania. All of these other things that would have been so much better than the fucking path that they went down. Frankly, this whole thing with Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania feels very forced and very put together at the last minute. Very rushed. If anything, the bigger story that's there from a Wyatt family standpoint is Luke Harper versus Bray Wyatt. And that's what should be the WrestleMania match. And most certainly not for the fucking title. So people can sit there and geek out because they're happy Cena lost, and it, it's whatever. You can sit there and be happy for Bray Wyatt. But look at Bray Wyatt and what his character has been. The fuck makes you think that he's worthy of carrying one of the world titles into WrestleMania? The fuck makes you think that this story in any way is going to be interesting or compelling between Elimination Chamber and WrestleMania? And especially if it gets to that point where you've got Orton versus Wyatt at WrestleMania, you really end up in a lose-lose situation. Because if Randy Orton wins, then Bray Wyatt winning the belt was a fucking waste of time. And if Randy Orton loses, then lo and behold, you've wasted that Rumble birth for somebody else not to ultimately cash in. Now, the Royal Rumble winner can't win the belt every single year, but God damn it all. It feels like it's almost entering into that no-win situation, which is ultimately how I felt watching this show, especially with all the incessant cut-ins they showed to Carmella the Tranny Girl and freaking James Ellsworth. Who gives a shit? I don't. 
for those of you that have been pumping smack down by my down my fucking throat for the past several months, here's to you. Even if you want to argue it is better than raw, it is. Number one, by how much? Number two, how much does that really say? And number three, if it still sucks, what the fuck is the difference?